Oil deposits. I've had questions on this all the time. Well, you know, how do we know they all got here the way we think we got here? Well, we studied geology, and the evolutionists must be right because the oil field people follow geology. No, they don't. Uniformitarian geology is frequently defended on the ground that it has worked so well in leading to the discovery of economically important deposits of petroleum and metals. It is maintained that it must be basically correct or else it could not have served so well as a guiding philosophy in economic geology. How many captains of industry know where oil is because of their Geology 101 course in college? But two replies can quickly be given to this sort of statement. In the first place, it has apparently not worked very well, as the discovery of valuable deposits of any kind is hardly on anything approaching a fully scientific basis as yet. In the second place, such techniques have all actually been found helpful in exploration do not really depend on the historical aspect of geology at all, but only on recognition of particular structural and sedimentary markers. I heard this by a geologist who was in the oil field business specifically. That just the markers, we just don't know how to find the markers, but it's random at best. That experience is shown or associated with such deposits. You know, you don't, they don't look at studying geology and counting the years <clears throat> and the Pleistocene era and so on. They look for the markers. They do a little drilling and look in there and say, okay, this is good. It looks like there's a deposit over here because there's geographical evidence of <clears throat> an area here that's less dense than the rock near it. <clears throat> oil is less dense than rock. Hello? As a matter of fact, oil discovery is still not very efficient scientifically. <clears throat> The following comment points up a few of the per pertinent statistics coming as it does from one of the country's leading petroleum geologists. So, sorry for the interruption phone call. I'm getting interrupted all day today. Oil is getting harder to find. The high risks inherent in the research for oil are unusually high in the business world. Statistics show that only one wildcat weld in nine discovers oil or gas. Only one in 44 proves to be a profitable venture. Only one in 427 discovers a field of some number 25 million barrels. And only one in 991 finds a real payoff, a major pool with 50 million or more barrels. It's a big operation. So you're not going to go to too much expense unless you have a, a big uh, payoff. R.D. Sloan in the future of the exploration geologist. So consideration of the biblical point of view of geology could hardly do worse in finding oil than the track record of the evolution-minded geologists. And yet, in fact, uniformitarian geology has not been able to develop even a generally acceptable theory as to the origin of oil or its basic source material. While agreement is nearly complete on the organic source of petroleum, <clears throat> there are wide differences of opinion on the process by which it was formed and on the nature of the organic matter from which it was derived. Further differences of thought arise when an attempt is made to explain the transformation of organic source material into petroleum. Heat and pressure, bacterial action, radioactive bombardment, and catalytic reactions, each has its proponents as the chief source of energy responsible for the conversion. But nobody definitively has proved anything. So the geologists that are in the oil business are not at the doorstep of collegiate theorists and evolutionary theorists, or hypothetical people. Yeah, these aren't theories because they're not observable, repeatable, or falsifiable so far. It is apparent that once again, and in this most important, both economically and in numbers of geologists concerned, 
all, of all geological disciplines, the principle of uniformity has proved impotent. I'm going to fix that word. Impotent. To put it in capitals. <clears throat> Although some use is made of micropaleontology in correlation of oil bearing strata, <clears throat> its economic applicability is almost entirely local. That is, geologists can identify a given uh, formation from two or more well logs by the microfossils contained in the cuttings and thus orient the log with respect to some plane of interest. But this can only be done on a local scale within the confines of the given formation. The process, so they've already discovered oil. Maybe they want to know a little bit more about how much. The process is virtually no value or significance for regional correlations. Even on the local scale, the microfossils are not nearly so important as other factors revealed by the well logs. Professional geologists working in the petroleum industry are apt to lose sight of the importance of fossils, for within the confines of one oil field and even one sedimentary basis, basin, bed tracing by litho litho lithological characters <coughs> and by electric logging makes fossils appear superfluous. They don't even pay any attention. That's what this one oil field guy told me. Walter H. Booker, Inter International Responsibilities of Geologists. As a matter of fact, the biblical doctrine of a universal catastrophic flood best describes the occurrence of oil. One important fact accounts in large measure for the difficulty in explaining the origin and geological history of oil, namely that oil has been found in rocks of practically all so-called geologic ages, except the so-called Pleistocene. It is a feature essentially common to all the stratified rocks and therefore cannot be easily located by means of the usual stratigraphic and paleontologic criteria for identifying rocks upon which the model of evolution is based. Why? Because when you want to find out what a rock is, you find, out, find the fossil that's in, embedded in it. You want to find out what a fossil is, find the rock that that uh, contains it. But the problem with that is there's so many different kinds of rocks and so many different kinds of fossils. And are they going to be all based in, uh, with a basin of oil underneath it? So, this fact also gives strong testimony that such a universal phenomenon as oil, found as it is in all the rock systems, must have a universal explanation. Universal worldwide flood. <clears throat> the conditions of its formation must have been essentially the same everywhere. Rather than supporting thereby the concept of uniformity in time, this fact seems to rather to evidence the fact of uniformity of manner of origin and formation and thereby to imply one global event which somehow brought about the genesis of all of the great oil reserves of the great Earth's cusp, crust. Because if it's found everywhere in, amongst the geological strata, all the rocks, then there's no particular pinpoint where you can go back in so many years, that's when they all started forming. This universal occurrence of petroleum is indicated by Cox as follows. <clears throat> petroleum occurs in rocks of all ages, from the Cambrian to the Pliocene, Pliocene inclusive, but no evidence has been found to prove that any petroleum has been formed since the Pliocene, although sedimentation patterns and thicknesses in Pleistocene and recent sediments are similar to those in the Pleocene where petroleum has formed. Similarity doesn't prove identity, right? Ben B. Cox, Transformation of Organic Material into Petroleum under Geological Conditions. We would suggest that there must be a connection between the fact that the Pleistocene and recent sediments, oh, recent is capital R, okay, Oh, it's, a, it's a specific uh, area. And recent se sediments 
oh yeah, the age uh, that's recent, are post-Diluvian. And the fact that in these only has no petroleum deposit been found. Otherwise, the reason for this fact is quite mysterious. A very few oil deposits. Oh, let me stop here. I'm going to say, probably I've covered this. What about the synthetic oils, which are laboratory formed in the factory now? Immediately. They put it under certain pressures, put the ingredients in the pot, and we got synthetic oil. Anyway, a few very oil deposits have been noted in both Precambrian and Pleistocene deposits, but these are known to have migrated into them after earlier formation and deposition in other sedimentary rocks. Worldwide flood does that. One layer come another, another upheaval, massive scale. The absence of oil in Pleistocene rocks is all the more mysterious in view of the fact that some petroleum hydrocarbons have been found in recent sediments, indicating that long ages are not required for the formation of such hydrocarbons. Reference P.B. Smith, Jr., the occurrence of hydrocarbons in recent sediments from the Gulf of Mexico. At the same time, these hydrocarbons are definitely not petroleum, which evidently requires special conditions of some kind before it will form. How about heat, pressure? W.E. Hansen says, although hydrocarbons form an important part of the organic fraction of recent sediments, crude oil as we know, it has been not, it's not formed in these sediments, even well beyond the zone of major bacterial activity. Some chemical aspects in, of petroleum genesis. Okay. About all that is definitely known is that petroleum occurrences seem to have no particular relation to particular stratigraphic sequences or to structural forms. Neither the paleontologic history nor the deformational history appears to bear any necessary relation to actual oil deposits. Moving on, reservoir rocks that contain petroleum differ from one another in various ways. They range in geologic age from Precambrian all the way to the bottom to Pliocene, way to the top, in a composition from silicious silicon to carbonate in origin from sedimentary to igneous, in porosity from 1 to 40 percent, and in permeability from one millidarcy to many darcies. Ooh, who's darcy? Okay. There is a wide variation also in the character of the trap that remains retains the pool. The trap may have been formed as a result of causes that are entirely structural or entirely strat stratigraphic, or from any combination of these cases. Too many variables. The geologic history of the trap may vary widely from a single geologic episode to a combination of many phenomena in extending over a long period of geologic time. Pools trapped in limestone and dolomite reservoir rock, for example, have the same relations that pools trapped in sandstone rocks have to such things as the reservoir fluids, oil water, and oil gas contacts, and trapped boundaries. Yet the chemical reactions of the reservoir rock and the effects of solution, cementation, sediment, uh, cementation and compaction and recrystallization are quite different in sandstone and carbonate reservoirs. <laughs> Again, too many variables. You can't draw conclusions. You have to be there. And millions and millions of years are supposed to be uh, bypassing. The most immediate apparent conclusion from all of this is that the accumulation of petroleum into traps must have occurred after all, or practically all, the strata were laid down, since they are apparently entirely independent of the particular type of rock, but are, and nevertheless, similar to each other in hydraulic characteristics. Will it contain liquid or not? Right? The main feature that all such deposits have in common is that of being associated with water. Nearly every petroleum pool exists within an environment of water, free, interstitial, edge, and bottom water. This means that the problem of migration is intimately related to hydrology, hydraulics, and groundwater movement. Hey, worldwide flood, you get it? Another extremely important fact is that the apparently all petroleum is organic in origin. You get the live plants, bed them up, put them under pressure, squash them down, squeeze the oil out of them. There, you, there have been inorganic theories of origin in the past, <coughs> but the accumulated evidence now is overwhelming that petroleum has an organic basis, so you can't go